In this video, I'm going to be talking about two topics, 8.7 and 8.8, .8, persistent organic pollutants and bioaccumulation and biomagnification. We classify pollutants using a number of criteria. One of the most important, though, is how long it lasts in the environment. How long does the pollutant last before it naturally degrades? We use a number of other variables as well, including if the pollutant is synthetic or natural, how quickly it can spread out through air and water, and how easily organisms can take it in. We also observe the effects that it has on the organisms and how toxic the pollutant is. The first criterion to focus on is persistence. A pollutant's persistence is a quantifiable measure of how long it's going to take for the pollutant to break down into harmless compounds. Therefore, it probably goes without saying that the longer lasting a pollutant is, the more potential harm it can cause. We're going to be focusing specifically on organic pollutants, and we classify them as persistent organic pollutants, or POPs. There are a number of different types of persistent organic pollutants, and some of them are in fact naturally occurring. They can be released by volcanic eruptions, and even are the result of some organisms' natural biochemical processes. But the vast majority of them are in fact human-made. You're not going to be expected to have the structures or names of any of these pollutants memorized, but you should be able to recognize a few features that are pretty consistent throughout each of these examples. One is that they are carbon-based. That's the organic part in persistent organic pollutants. Each of these is either a chain of carbon atoms linked together, or they form ring structures as well. Another common theme with persistent organic pollutants is the presence of halogens. So, in each of the categories, we can see, for example, chlorine. There might also be bromine present. And then in some of the ones down at the bottom, we see fluorine present. So persistent organic pollutants are, are of course, carbon-based and oftentimes contain halogens as well. Some of these persistent organic pollutants can be formed unintentionally through combustion. When we incinerate waste, for example, when we burn backyard trash, which is more common in rural areas that don't have trash pickup services, and even as byproducts of some industrial processes. But the ones we're most concerned about are the ones that are intentionally manufactured. Persistent organic pollutants are used as flame retardants and oftentimes as pesticides. Insecticides are used to kill insects, herbicides to kill plants, and fungicides to kill fungi. One of the best known POPs is DDT. DDT was widely used as an insecticide after World War II. Thanks to the work of biologist Rachel Carson, who initially began studying the effects of DDT on the shells of birds' eggs, we now know through her work and her book called Silent Spring that DDT had much farther reaching effects than originally thought. Be sure to take a look at the video linked above that explores DDT a little further. How organisms can be exposed to these pollutants varies, but generally, ingestion of food is a typical mode of exposure. There has been some research that suggests that inhalation of dust particles that have been contaminated with those pollutants is also possible. The fact that pollutants are soluble in lipids means that they can be taken in by organisms very easily and they end up biomagnifying in organisms' fatty tissues. We're going to explore biomagnification and bioaccumulation in a few moments. The effects of the pollutant vary depending on the pollutant itself, but some of the more common effects include disruption to the endocrine systems and reproductive systems. DDT, for example, interferes with the way that testosterone functions. Polychlorinated biphenyls affect the way that the liver functions. Many of these pollutants are classified as carcinogens, 
or cancer-causing agents. In some cases, the effects of these pollutants can be synergistic. What synergistic means is that the negative consequences are greater than the sum of the pollutants individually. Thanks to the Stockholm Convention, there is an international system in place for the classification of persistent organic pollutants. It was first put in place by a division of the United Nations in 2001, and its purpose was to study what might be POPs and then ultimately classify them so they could be tracked. A number of POPs have in fact been banned thanks to their recognition under the Stockholm Convention. Most nations have signed and ratified the Stockholm Convention with a couple of exceptions. The United States has signed on to it, but the fact that it hasn't ratified it means that the U.S. doesn't need to adhere to its stipulations. Originally, 12 POPs were classified under the Stockholm Convention, including DDT and polychlorinated biphenyls, but more recently, 10 more have been included on that list. A set of concepts related to pollutants is how they travel through food webs and become incorporated into an organism's mass. The first concept is bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulation is when compounds build up within a particular organism or trophic level. This occurs because the rate at which those organisms take in the compound is faster than the rate that they can be metabolized or excreted. Compounds that are fat-soluble are more easily accumulated than those that are water-soluble. Those fat-soluble compounds tend to accumulate in an organism's fatty tissues. The second concept is biomagnification. Biomagnification is the result of increasing concentrations of those compounds as we go up subsequently higher trophic levels. The reason why this occurs is traced back to the 10% rule. Because organisms only obtain a small percentage of the energy from trophic levels below them, they need to eat greater numbers of those lower trophic level organisms to get the energy they need to sustain their life. That, of course, also means they're going to be consuming more and more of whatever toxic compounds those lower trophic level organisms possess. The main consequence of this is that higher trophic level organisms will have the greatest concentrations of compounds, and much higher than those at lower levels. We oftentimes see this in terms of pollutants like DDT. Although the environment has a relatively low concentration of that pollutant, as producers begin to take those pollutants in, and herbivores consume those producers, and so on, the higher level organisms need to consume great quantities of the organisms beneath them, and therefore also have greater concentrations of the pollutants it is critically important to make a distinction between bioaccumulation and biomagnification. In bioaccumulation, a toxin builds up over time in the tissues, especially fatty tissues, of an individual organism. But biomagnification results in organisms at higher trophic levels having greater concentrations of a toxin than do lower levels. Be sure to check out the video that's linked above for a review of trophic structure and how it connects to biomagnification. Some of the most commonly bioaccumulated and biomagnified compounds include some of the POPs that we saw earlier. Their effects vary based on the concentration present in the environment and the species being affected. Thanks to Rachel Carson, we know that DDT weakens the shells of bird's eggs it's a carcinogen, and it's an endocrine disruptor. Polychlorinated biphenyls are mutagens, which can lead to mutations in DNA. They can also cause developmental or birth defects and damage the liver as well. Hexachlorobenzene is a carcinogen, especially of the liver and kidneys, 
and it's particularly toxic to aquatic organisms. Methylmercury is a naturally occurring compound. About 70% of the methylmercury found in the environment is the result of microbes producing it under oxygen-free environments. The problem with it is that it's not easily metabolized and can actually mimic other biomolecules that organisms need. It can easily pass through the gastrointestinal tract as well as the placenta into a fetus and can cross the blood-brain barrier. It causes developmental difficulties and usually ends up causing people to have lower IQs and can as well result in cardiovascular problems, including heart attacks. And that concludes this video. Thank you all for watching and until next time, take care.